Hey guys, uh, thanks for uh, coming back and tuning in. Um, we've got another complex uh, session for you, one which people still struggle with because there's no straightforward uh, algorithms. Uh, Dr. Wang from China will be talking about and helping moderate the acquired flat foot. Um, Dr. Wang, it's all yours. Hi, uh, good evening. Uh, this is the best of times. This is the worst of times. COVID blocked us apart. It also joined us together. Thanks to Dr. Parekh and the Parekh Family Foundation for supporting foot and ankle surgery education. Tonight, we have four specialists with us. Dr. King Wai Chong from Singapore, Dr. Siu Wa Kong from Hong Kong, China, Dr. Chua Yeo Ping from Malaysia, and uh, Dr. Yuan Zhu from mainland China. That of flat foot deformity, has always been a challenge for foot and ankle surgeons. Many procedures are used to manage it, but still there is no real consensus. Dr. Kong, you have a lot of experience in tendinoscopy. Please share your case with us. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks Dr. Wang's introduction. So, and uh, in the coming 15 minutes, I'm going to present four of my cases about the uh, uh, how I treat uh, those of the especially early stage of the adult fat foot and so I have the no, nothing to disclose here. So the first case which was a 48 years old gentleman, he was an office worker and uh, he had the right medial ankle pain for more than six months and uh, we have tried conservative treatment such as the custom insole and tri seal with uh, only some improvement. So on physical examination and the high foot the, the alignment which was normal and there was tiptoe stand and uh, either single leg and double leg, which was normal. And there was focal swelling over the right medial ankle for the posterior tibia tendon, which was palpable along the whole course. And power wise, it was four over five. There was no tightness on the Achilles tendon, the ankle joint, which was normal. So, and trust me that because of that, there was no X-ray radiological feature of that foot. So I didn't put it, put, put it in my presentation. I did the MI for this gentleman. So you can see from the green arrow, it is a effusion along the posterior tibia tendon. So the effusion, which is extend from the most distal part and up to the above the medial malleolus, and uh, from the coronal view, that would be the same. So, and however, in axial view, besides we can see the effusion, we can also see that there's a longitudinal tear on the posterior tibial tendon. And I put all three views together. The green lines indicate the level that we are looking for from the three different directions. That was sagittal, coronal, and also the axial. So this is another three views. And uh, I checked the blood for this gentleman and blew out those of the inflammatory apotrophy. And I also uh, blew out those of the, uh, the, whether there's any active infection. So the diagnosis for this gentleman, which and uh, he was suffering from the stage one PTDD. So that according to the Johnson and Strong classification. And um, so treatment wise and, and uh, Stotter one's introduction. And currently when I treat the stage one PTDD, especially those failed conservative treatment, I always do the um, tendoscopy. That was the posterior tibial tendoscopic department plus cyanovectomy and plus the tendon repair. Uh, so this is a clinical picture showing that and I make two portals. It was the two portal technique. So, and then the distal portal and also the proximal portal. So which is around 2.5 centimeters away from the posterior medial corner of the medial malleolus. And uh, I use the 2.7 millimeter scope, 30 degrees. And now uh, I make the distal portal first and then subsequently using the inside out technique to find out the possible portal. So once the scope was going in and then in this gentleman, we can see there's a flat hair on the posterior tibial tendon together with that, there was sinovitis along the tendon, uh, tendon shift as well. And uh, so we start to the debitement after set up the po possible portal. And uh, so in this, you can see the posterior TP tendon. There's a lot of new vessel which was formed, which was formed. So it's one of the feature for the tendinosis. And uh, I'm using the radio frequency probe to coagulate all these of the new vessel. And uh, I use the 1.4. This is the micro beta to coagulate all those of the new vessel. And um, as before the sur before the surgery, the MI showing that there's a pair on the tendon. So then I'm using the probe to find out where exactly is the tendon tear. So then immediately above the skin, I make another small incision. So I'm using this incision to repair the posterior tibial tendon. So 
as this gentleman didn't do any bony procedure, so I put her, put him on four weeks of air cast protection. I can allow him to have fully weight bear immediately after after the surgery. And then uh, we start the physio once the wound is stable, which is, was two to three weeks later, and then to strengthen the posterity dependent. And for this such case, I always use the custom made insert and uh, in the future to further support those of the, the to protect the posterity dependent. So potential complication. So in theory, the minimal invasive te 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 technique that would be less complication. So it, it is correct. And but however, for me and um, and um, endoscopy, then uh, more complication may become from the technical errors. So such as uh, occasionally we will approach to the wrong tendon because the posterior TB tendon is close to the FDL. The FDL is even close to the neurovascular bundle. So if we approach to the wrong tendon, we may potentially increase the chance of the neurovascular bundle because the, the neurovascular bundle injury because the, the nerve which is more close to the to the Facts of digital longest than the posterior tibial tendon. And also, and uh, before mastering the techniques, and, um, and sometimes when compared to the open synovectomy, so someone say that um, tendoscopy may have inadequate department and assessment. But if you master this technique, I think that the, the outcome of the, uh, come, the, the outcome of the surgery will be, will be, will be the same as the open procedure. So the case to actually is that exactly the same as the first case. The way only difference is this gentleman is really heavy and it's around 200 pounds. And secondly, he has the radiological feature of the fat foot. So, and in treating this case, and additionally to the endoscopy, I also add the medial calcaneal osotomy to, to further protect the, the repair the posterior dependent. So, this is um, showing the protocol. And um, everything will be the same. So, only the, the when we perform the uh, calcaneal osotomy, we have a longer protection, which I will I will further explain in, in the case three. So the case three is a 31, 51 years old gentleman. He worked in IT field and he enjoyed good past health. He was a non-smoker. He was active in jogging and running. He had the left medial arch pain for six months time, but there was dull ache around the midfoot region and uh, the pain, which was mechanical in nature. And uh, again, we tried the conservative treatment without really significant improvement. We checked the blood to rule out the inflammatory R4 per, per B. He has no history of a gout arthritis. And on physical examination, the high foot shows a, a bit mild in vulgus. There was mild fattening on over the medial arch. No too many toe side, the tip to stand, the subtalar joint, which was mobile. There was focal tenderness at the medial arch region. The posterior tip tendon apparently which was intact and there was no neurological deficit over the free ankle region. And then looking from the clinical picture, we can see that the high foot is a bit in bulgous, but whenever he did the tip toe stand and the alignment become better. And um, the weight bearing x-ray showing that there's a significant sagging on the medial arch, especially the sagging from the navicular cuneiform joint. And also if you look closely, the first TNT joint also have a little bit of a change. So then currently he was, the, the problem is that I checked the high foot alignment field. We can see that the high foot is being vulgar. The AP foot, the first TNT joint is also a bit of flighters. So the, the MRI showing that the aflita change on the uh, metatarsal cuneiform joint. And also the degenerative cyst, which was formed on over the first TNT joint. And that, the gentleman which is suffering from the fat foot together with the mifarthritis to solve this problem is because the pain is arising from the arthritis. At the same time, he has the acquired fat foot. So that I treat him by doing the fusion. The fusion is the, is the metatarsal cuneiform navicular fusion to restore the, the normal arch, medial arch and also to control the, uh, the relieve the arthritic change. And also together we add the medial sliding calcaneal osteotomy. So and uh, during the surgery we're using a mini C arm. Then we check everything seems to be not quite normal. So we put two screws to fix the calcaneal osteotomy using a screw and pay to fuse the joint. And together with those of the bone mineral pot and bone matrix protein and the mineralized bone matrix. So the alignment seems good in try up and uh, even though some is by some screw which is which is a bit longer. Um, 
So one year puts off. So it seems that alignment is a is a realigned and then the fusion is fused. So before we compare the before the surgery and after the surgery, so the, the arch which was realigned. But unfortunately, it's not unfortunate, it's that and the, during the surgery, I using the mini CM to check the, the alignment, but maybe my mistake at that time, I, I did, didn't do enough wheel. So after the surgery, we found that actually one of the school, which is not totally inside the calcanea. So that, that but fortunately, is the calcanea osotomy is really, the healing power is really good. So even one school is missed, then the, 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 the osotomy is still will heal uneventfully. And uh, so region for, for for me to do the fusion and uh, or sotomies, I I using the air cast for 12, 12 weeks instead. Allow first six weeks of touchdown walking, second six weeks full weight bearing walking, and in the future I always use the custom insert in the future. So potential complication you can see in this case it is an impact. So then uh, from after that case and every time I did the similar procedure, I would check more view instead and to make sure that the screw in the correct position. So then the bone healing is also another another potential complication. Uh, but luckily it's not happened in, in my case because I, I add a lot of the like those of the DBX and the BMP and the patient which was not non-smoker. So then uh, they, they will and and re reduce the, the bone healing complication. So the last case, which is 60 second, 62 years old gentleman, who was a retired businessman, who was not active in sport except golf. He will enjoy the good part self, and he was a non-smoker as well. And this case is he was not obese, but the high foot is a bit vulgar. No AB, no for AB duction, no fixed four foot supination. A case tendon which was not tight, no neurological deficit. This this whole situation is good. So and again, from looking from behind, the foot is a bit in vulgar. So he was unable to do single leg tiptoes there. By doing the double leg tiptoes, you can still see that the high foot which cannot. Be called totally correct, and uh, the X the MRI showing that there's a complete rupture of the posterior tibia tendon in this gentleman. So and both at the secretive view and also in the coronal view. So the diagnosis for this because it's a complete rupture and it belong to the stage two PTTB. So then I treat this is just like those of classic treatment. I did the posterior tibia tendon debridement plus the FBL transfer plus the medial calcaneal sliding osteotomy. So it's an open procedure. We figure out the FDL, that is the flexor digital longus. I drew a tunnel on the navicular bone and then pull through the FDL and fix with the interference screw. And for the, the distal stem of the FDL, I always do the tenodesis to the FHL. So besides that, I also did the calcaneal osotomy to, to further protect the medial arch. Unfortunately, by three weeks time, so that osotomy will wound heal uneventfully. But however, the heel wound, which is break down, this is the wound that I put two screws inside to, to fix the calcaneal osotomy. So I did the black culture, wound culture, and also the x-ray to rule out the osteomyelitis. I did the around six weeks of the of the antibiotics with the daily dressing. And luckily in eight weeks time, the wound is healed. And then that you can see that the alignment because of the osotomy, it looks better, more in neutral now. And I post out one year, so you can see the, the bone heal and event for me. And then, um, yeah, when when standing, there would be no obvious effect food, and then the, the calcaneal sort of heal and event for me. Post out regime will be the same as the third case. So the complication, you can see that now, wound sometimes, even if it's not a big wound, if it is happened, they can be a disaster. It's very really unlucky, and uh, my case we can eventually treat without need to revise the calcaneal osteotomy. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Doctor Kong. Any questions? I think in my uh, experience, um, there are very few people with. Uh, pathology to the posterior tibial tendon alone. Usually, uh, usually I would treat them with uh, non-surgical uh, non treatment like custom-made insole or uh, non-steroid uh, uh, anti-inflammatory drugs. Yes, but, but, but I think that the, the stage one and the PTDD is not that uncommon. 
Mm-hmm. Many of time, uh, as your suggestion, yes, I always try to treat it conservatively. If it is successful, then uh, we, we don't need the surgery. But but some of them, ex- ex- actually, even if it's not that common, so if patients have the inflammatory apopathy, like those of seronegative <laughs> as for the apopathy, then um, it's better to treat it with the tendoscopic refinement in early stage. The reason is that the disease, they may progress and eventually they may cause some rupture on the tendon. Oh, okay. Uh, do you think uh, it's the posterior tibial tendon caused the flat foot deformity or uh, or the uh, or flat foot deformity so caused the ten- tendon for the tendon the problem? Tendon. Yeah, I think that it is a quite a uh, combined situation. So and uh-huh. um, usually the, the posterior tibial, tibial tendon, even there's a very inflamed, and the first day they may not causing rupture. If there's a no rupture, then they may not have the progressive and, uh, and deformity in the, the, at the at the left foot. And um, um, and another issue is, and uh, if people have the accessory navicular at the same time, so with the inflammation or the posterior tibial tendon, I trust that that this situation that will be more commonly to cause of the left foot. Instead of only the the, the posterior tibial tendon nitus. Uh, and if you leave the, the patient stage one patient untreated, uh, do you think they will proceed to stage two, or even advanced stages? You mean leave untreated and we we did nothing, uh, even no uh, conservation or no surgical treatment. Uh, no surgical treatment, I mean. No surgical treatment, I, I don't think that it's very, very common that, that they will proceed to a lot, they will become further deteriorated. But but this kind of patient relatively is younger. If they are active, they they mostly they may not tolerate to those of the long term pain. So they always ask for, for certain kinds of treatment. So that's why I I, I, I do quite a lot of the uh, kind of public development for, for this kind of the young relatively young age group and relatively active in sport and uh, relatively they, they, they want to achieve a, a, a bit higher in life quality population. Dr. Chong has questions. Do you always send the tissue that you take from the endoscope to test the histopathology? Um, not always, not always. And unless when, when looking through the tendoscopy, it is very unusual. Otherwise, just like those of the normal sinovitis, I don't send for specimen. Okay, let's move to Dr. Chong's cases. Dr. Chong, would you please unmute yourself? Okay, it's fine now. Okay, good uh, morning and good evening to uh, wherever you are. Uh, I'm going to have uh, four cases to discuss and I think what I've chosen is four cases from of flat foot from, from a mild deformity to uh, increasingly uh, uh, severe deformity so that we can discuss the, the management plans because it's you uh, Dr. Celine earlier was absolutely right in saying that there is no, at the moment, no fixed protocol or formula for treating flat foot at different stages. So it is very much an a la carte surgery and not a set meal. So my first case is a 20 year old young male. He's quite heavy, 77 kilogram by Asian standards. Painful pest planus at the arch after activities since young and it's getting worse because he has enlisted in the army. So clinically, he has a tight gastrocnemius muscle and it was a flexible deformity. Uh, he has tried orthotics for several years with minimal effect. So let's have a look at his x-rays and you can see some of the alignment um, that is shown. And these are consistent with a mild uh, flat feet deformity. I like to do... Uh, 
Mortis, standing Mortis view, uh, including the foot. And uh, I like to look at the hind foot alignment using uh, my technique, which I will elaborate on a little bit. But essentially, it is uh, uh, related to the fibular axis. And you can see very nicely the hind foot valgus or varus deformity in the patient's normal functional uh, stance position and not in an abnormal uh, dorsiflex uh, Salzman view. So what's the treatment? Do we continue conservative treatment because it's very mild and it's not worth uh, sending him for surgery, uh, especially when it might involve uh, bone procedure? Uh, heel cord lengthening, peri-taylor peri stabilization with a stent, uh, arthroiresis or some similar uh, implant, lateral column lengthening, medializing calcaneal osteotomy, medial soft tissue procedures, or a combination. So these are the, the, the problems that, has, that, that we have faced because there is no fixed protocol uh, and management plan for flat foot because it is a very diverse group of patients. So these patients, this patient is a mild deformity. So I decided to do something mild and minimally invasive. I did an endoscopic gastrocnemius uh, lengthening and uh, insertion of a uh, subtalar uh, implant, which is the hypercure, which is the implant of my choice. And you can see that his pre-op and post-op alignment. And you can see the, um, if you, to, to, to eyeball this x-ray, you would see that pre-op, much of his foot is lateral to the, to the fibular axis. And after surgery, a lot less of his foot is lateral to the fibular axis, telling us that his valgus deformity has been corrected. And this is his AP X-ray, again, showing much improved uh, metatarsal, uh, Taylor metatarsal angles. And this is his clinical appearance, his left foot being the one that had surgery done, and the right foot was essentially the same uh, appearance as the left, but this is before surgery, and the patient was sufficiently happy to come back for surgery on the opposite side. So this is a simple case. Now let's look at a little bit more difficult case. This is a 45-year-old female nurse, 75 kilograms. Again, PTT, painful, MRI shows tendinopathy and an unstable uh, accessory navicular, unable to heal raise, but can invert foot against resistance, which means that the posterior tibial tendon power is at least grade three. Now, this is important when I make my clinical decision when the power is at least grade three. She has asymmetrical heel valgus and test planus and a painful bunion. She's unable to work and, she, and has failed conservative treatment. So this is the clinical location of the pain, essentially two places where the accessory navicular and the posterior tibial tendon insertion is and also where the bunion is. So these are her x-rays showing a, a moderate flat foot deformity uh, with, an, with a huge accessory navicular bone and a bunion and hallux, hallux valgus deformity. So what are the options? Do we treat only the flat foot or do we treat the flat foot and the hallux valgus at the same time? So, and if so, how? So again, some options, heel cord lengthening, uh, arthroiresis, lateral column lengthening, MCO, essentially the same set of, of uh, options that we are, that is in our armamentarium, uh, including a head lowering lapidus procedure or a head lowering scarf osteotomy to address the hallux valgus or a combination. So this is what I did. Um, I did the endoscopic gastrocnemius uh, recession, uh, hypercure insertion, uh, modified kidney procedure to remove the, the accessory navicular and a scarf Akins osteotomy in the process of which I was, uh, I was able to lower the metatarsal head. So this is the pre and post-op of this patient. Again, the lateral view showing a very nice uh, uh, alignment. And this is the clinical appearance of the foot after surgery. And you can see that it has essentially gone back to a pretty good uh, alignment of the hind foot and comparable to her normal right foot. Now, case three, this is a 40 year old female with severe bilateral pest planus since young. So in, in, in East Asia, especially, we have a lot of uh, adolescent flat foot 
that may not have any problems and they and they eventually become adults and they start to have problems at a much later age. Uh, getting worse, painful PTP tendinopathy on MRI with fluid around the os navicular again. So she went for left foot surgery in another hospital and she was pretty unhappy with the outcome. But let's have a look. This was this is her left foot pre-op. Now, uh, we often see x-rays like this, lateral x-rays like this, which does not seem that flat, but clinically she is very flat and often these kind of x-rays are not proper weight bearing x-rays. So we have to suspect and we cannot base our decision making on an x-ray like that when it is so poorly taken. Especially when the tibia is slanting backwards, you know that this person is not standing. This person is either sitting on a chair and flexing the knee and putting the leg up on a platform or standing in front of a platform and putting a flex knee uh, uh, up on the platform to get this image and they, re and they label it as weight bearing, which is absolutely wrong. But anyway, we will talk about this uh, at another occasion. So what was done at the previous hospital? She had a proximal medial gastrocnemius recession MCO, hypercure, lapidus, and a flexor digitorum longus transfer. And this is her post-op x-rays, and the hind foot is still in valgus, and you can see that the foot is still flat. If you look at the Mary's angle and the Mary's line, they are absolutely not corrected. And if you look at the fibula axis, a lot of the foot is still lateral to the axis, which shows that the hind foot is still in valgus. And she is complaining of stiff toes, a very stiff and tight foot. Why? Because of a lot of extensive surgery that was done on the foot itself. And this is about a year after surgery. So that we have an unhappy patient. So now she sees me for surgery on the right foot, requesting for a better outcome. So the pressure is there. She wants a better outcome. Okay. And the right foot is essentially the same with a bunion deformity, severe midfoot sac, and a valgus alignment of the hind foot. And what should I do differently? So that is the problem. What should I do differently? Essentially, the left, these are the procedures that were, that were done on the left foot, which she was unhappy about. So what options now do I have to make her better? Do I do different surgery or do I modify the surgery that was done previously? So this is what I did. Instead of a proximal medial gastrocnemius recession, I did an endoscopic recession distally, which is a valpius type uh, recession for more release. The PMGR, proximal release, I feel has some ha is limited. It doesn't release as much. For the medializing calcaneal osteotomy, instead of making a big incision, I decided to do it minimally invasive. For the hypercure, I think she would do with a better size and better position. The left side was not the right size and not the right position. For the lapidus, I think she will need a lot more flexion with bone grafting of the large dorsal gap after you have pressed the metatarsal head down. And I would just excise the os navicular without an FDL transfer. I do not think she needs an FDL transfer when clinically she has pre-op power of at least grade three. So the end result is better correction, less extensive surgery, and therefore less stiffness of the whole foot. So this is a study that um, that was, I was involved in about 15, 16 years ago. And basically it shows that you do not need a routine FDL transfer for flat foot correction. So this is post-surgery and you can see that the uh, uh, post-op alignment are all a lot improved. Um, and uh, the patient was happy with the outcome, felt that it was better than the left. This is the AP. Again, you can see the hind foot alignment from the mortise view of the standing ankle x-rays. And this is the right foot, which is my surgery versus the left foot, which was her previous surgery with a suboptimal correction of the hind foot alignment. Case four, 46 year old female, obese, right ankle, medium sided, huge. Can I ask you yes. one quick question? Yes. Um, we're getting some questions from the crowd. So I wanna ask you these before it's too yeah, sure. The first one is whether there is a role for any foot and ankle orthosis in these cases. Uh, of course, they, they well, in my, in my uh, uh, personal opinion, 
a lot of the stage two, um, when they uh, do not do not do very well in the long term with orthosis, uh, I think it is a deformity. It is a mechanical problem. There is a limit to how much orthotics can help. I would certainly put them on a period of orthotics, but not with very high hopes. I put them on a period of orthotics to exhaust their hope that conservative treatment will help them. Uh, uh, because I personally do not feel that it, it does help them a lot. So I'm actually quite aggressive with surgery at stage two. Okay. And what percentage of arthresis hardware is removed in the adult population due to pain? And what happens after you remove it to the correction that you had achieved? Okay, so uh, there are basically uh, two main types of arthroresis. There is a type one and a type two. I shall not go too much into, into detail, not in this forum. But essentially, uh, I am using uh, exclusively the hypercure implant, which is a type 2 implant, and this is inserted into the sinus canal a lot deeper. And in such patients, uh, in my experience, I have had to remove the device in adults in less than 1% of cases. Suffice to say that my, my two grown boys have got three hypercure implants in their foot. So I'm pretty convinced uh, that it works. But when you take it out, what has happened to the correction over time? So I have not had to take out an implant for a long time. But when I was using the predecessor, which was a type 1 implant, I had a removal rate of about 20%. And often, if I have follow-up patients where I've removed them beyond the point of six months, and the correction remains. So I think... If it is not an isolated procedure, you are combining it with other bone procedure like a medializing calcaneal osteotomy and so on, uh, the, 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 the soft tissue and the other bony procedures heal in a good position and the deformity is uh, 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 corrected. And the last question I have is on case three, uh, somebody wants to know, how would you correct the left foot that was previously operated on but done suboptimally so i have not got to correct the left foot yet because fortunate i was telling i was the patient was was unhappy but she wasn't functionally very disabled so i told her it's one year after three we'll wait a while let's sort out your right side and we'll see what happens but i think if i have to redo the left side so if i have to redo the left side this is what i will do i will i will put in a better sized stent, the subtalar stent, the arthroiresis stent. Uh, I think the size is a little bit small uh, and I will insert it further in, larger size. I will not touch the medializing calcaneal osteotomy. I think it's pretty well done. But I think the uh, gastrocnemius recession needs to be redone at the distal end with a valpius procedure and not a proximal medial release, which only releases one half of it. Uh, and I think she will need a flexion osteotomy of the medial column. The lapidus is well fused. And I think I will just do a flexion osteotomy at that, at that place to get that medial column down. Thanks. Okay, I think I will, I will leave out my last case and let the other uh, faculty talk because I'm gone past my 15 minutes. Uh, Dr. Wang. Dr. Wang, I will, I will let the other faculty talk because I have used up my 15 minutes. Okay. Uh, okay. Now, Dr. Chu's. Dr. Chu, would you please share your cases? Okay. Uh, can you see that? Uh. Okay, hi everyone. I'm uh, uh, Yuan Zhu from uh, Shanghai Regent Hospital, uh, Shanghai Jiao Tong University. Uh, I found some uh, picture of the modern and elegant hospital of uh, uh, Beijing. And 
I'd like to say uh, good morning, good afternoon, and a good evening to all the audience and the participants from all over the world. And thanks, uh, Dr. Bragg, for organizing this uh, uh, wonderful uh, Botanical Global Virtual Meeting. This reminds me of my visit to uh, Duke University as an uh, uh, AFS traveling fellow five years ago. Uh, you can find Dr. Parag and Dr. Diario, Dr. Nani, Dr. Easley, uh, this is me, and uh, Dr. Wang, the moderator of this section. I spent a good time there. Okay, let's uh, go to the case presentation. This was a, a 69 years old uh, gentleman with his uh, right hand for the pain for years. The weight bearing x-ray uh, showed foot arch collapse and a hind foot valgus deformity. He had a swelling and a valgus hind foot. The single heel rise test of his uh, right foot was positive. Uh, it's uh, very clear that he had a uh, flat foot deformity on the right side. Now the question is, uh, what what is the uh, classification, the treatment, and uh, the surgical procedure uh, if treated surgically? According to the Johnson and the Strom, <laughs> flat foot classification and the Milestones uh, modification. Uh, this was a case of a stage 2A. The routine uh, surgical option of this stage uh, should be uh, reservation of the joints. But I did a triple. The reason was when I did the uh, physical exam to him, I felt the joints were so loose. I had to say uh, they were too loose to a person of uh, 69, and uh, he uh, he was a big guy. The follow-ups showed good alignment and uh, healing uh, of the hind foot. He was pain-free and uh, very satisfied. This is another case, uh, 61 years old lady. She had a severe arch collapse and a hind foot valgus deformity. Uh, the joints were flexible. Again, the uh, classification, the treatment, and the, the, uh, the surgical procedure if treated surgically. And again, I did a triple to this patient with uh, flexible joints. You guys can see the reason uh, from her appearance. Yes, she was uh, very heavy. I think arthrodesis was a more reliable option to her. The follow-up showed good result. Uh, now I'd like to uh, share some uh, uh, adult uh, quad flyfold cases our team did uh, more than 10 years ago. Uh, this patient uh, received a calcaneal osteotomy uh, and the subtalar arthroiresis. Uh, you can see the implants here. And uh, combined with FDL transfer. The follow up showed good result, uh, <coughs> both clin uh, clinically and uh, uh, from the x ray. This is uh, another case uh, 47 years old lady. Uh, she uh, received a calcaneal osteotomy, FDL transfer, and the subtalar arthroiresis. Uh, the image during surgery showed the correction of alignment. And this is the final result. Here's a, a young lady with bilateral flat feet and a helix valgus. Uh, you can see uh, she had a flat feet and a hind foot valgus, uh, the weight bearing x ray. And she had uh, arthroiresis and uh, uh, bunion surgeries on both sides. 
uh, the result. So uh, the use of arthritis devices in adult patients remains controversial. Some uh, surgeons, such as uh, Myosin, are against this treatment in adults due to the complications. And some doctors, such as Sean, uh, agree to this treatment in adults and use it to protect the medial soft tissue reconstruction. Um, I also used the uh, uh, arthritis procedure in adult patient. My clinical research and experience were published in uh, 2014. And uh, there are uh, some other papers of our team uh, about the flat foot correction. So the take home message of this presentation are uh, arthrodesis can be used occasionally in some stage two cases. Although uh, preservation of a motion is the ideal goal, uh, a stable and uh, aligned foot are um, uh, more important and the patient's age and the body, body mass index uh, is a consideration. Uh, Subpillar arthroiresis is a reasonable treatment option for stage 2A and 2C AAFD. It can be used alone to correct mild uh, hind foot valgus, and it can also be performed with the calcinea stotomy to gain more correction to uh, in severe uh, stage 2 AAFD. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your attention. And any comments from the moderator and the panelists? Hi, Dr. Zhu. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, two of your cases, you combined arthritis and uh, osteo uh, calcaneal osteotomy together. Uh, when will you do arthritis alone? And when will you add uh, calcaneal osteotomy? I have mentioned that uh, if the, there are uh, mouth uh, deformity, uh, mouth, uh, uh, hind foot valgus, I will do only, uh, I will try the arthritis first and see if the, uh, if, uh, the deformity has been uh, correct or not. Uh, if, uh, if the, there are uh, more uh, severe um, deformity, I will, I will try the arthritis first and then uh, maybe add uh, can you ask the uh, uh, But by, by doing that, the, uh, I, I will not uh, slide the calcaneus uh, uh, too much. Okay, so you just uh, decide during the operation, right? Uh, that, uh, I beg your pardon? Uh, so you just decide during the operation? Yes, Maybe. yes. Okay. So, any comments from the other panelists? I, I have a ra radiological, uh, radiological uh, way of deciding, but it's going to take another lecture. So maybe I get invited back next year. Uh, but basically, it, it is related to my my the line. Um, it's called the fibular axis calcaneal overlap. Uh, if you if you if you do an X-ray of the patient in the mortise view, standing mortise view of the ankle, uh, and you draw a line through the axis of the fibula, uh, this line will cross the calcaneum if it if the foot is in is in significant valgus. So if then you need to find the lateral wall of the calcaneum, and from the lateral wall of the calcaneum you measure. The distance between this line and the lateral wall and if it is uh, less than four millimeters is normal it's the normal physiological valgus of our hind foot if it's four to eight millimeters an arthroiresis with or without a gastroc lengthening would suffice if it is um, eight to twelve then you will need an arthroiresis and a medializing calcaneal osteomy uh, otherwise, the hind foot valgus correction is not sufficient. And if it is more than 12, then you will need all of the above plus a medium medial column stabilization. 
Oh, thank you, Dr. Chong. Briefly. I think uh, time is not too much left. So let's welcome Dr. Chua for his more advanced stages cases. Hello, Dr. Chua. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Good morning. Good evening. <laughs> uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, thanks for inviting. So uh, in general, all these adult flat feet are presented with in serious onset, whether they have the flat foot before or they actually walk normally and after certain injury and have the uh, flat foot, we really don't know. So it's actually an activity aggravated pain at the medial side of the foot and ankle and you get fatigue or weakness of the foot and ankle in long run and problem with balancing is increasing when walking uh, is with the, um, I couldn't, I'm not able to uh, go next. Use your mouse. Try, try your mouse. Yeah, okay. So as the resist progress, then the, there is a pain over the subfibular area called subfibular impingement. This is also activity related pain at this area at sinus star sign and lateral manualis. Let's start with the first case of 50 years old lady come with the um, midfoot pain. So this is an x-ray. So on the lateral view, normal angle of the lateral tarsal, metatarsal angle is supposed to be about 0 to 10 degrees. And the calcaneal uh, angulation uh, pitch angle should be 20 to 30 degrees. So this is for her x-ray which you can see the calcaneal pitch angle is nearly zero and also the tasso mary angle also uh, deviated. And in general, we use uh, this classification stage one to stage four and I've summarized this to uh, for my clinical practice. When there's stage one, there's a painful posterior tibialis tendon. When there's stage two, the collapse arc is still flexible and when the arc is fixed, then it becomes a stage three. And when there's an ankle joint arthritis, then it becomes a stage four. So for treatment option for this patient, of course, I will try the media arc support until they're already fed up, like Dr. Uh, Chong said. We try about three to six months and they sometimes work and sometimes really they come, I have tried this for many months and it's not successful, it's still painful. Then, at a time, they are more convinced to go for operation. So uh, what, what operation you're going to do, whether a combination of procedure or just a triple fusion or a isolated uh, double fusion or any other treatment that we, we proceed. So for this patient, I use a combination of the surgery. This is a medial calcaneal uh, osteotomy. And usually I will translate about eight to 10 millimeter, of course, we need to uh, see the uh, heel alignment, but about maximum about 10 millimeter, you should be able to uh, 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 translate. Then whether to insert one screw to stabilize or two screw, and usually I use two screw for a better stabilization, but some people use one screw. And some people even use the plate on the uh, lateral side, but I always, taken off this lateral edge so that patient may not get lateral edge pain on the heel. And arthroadesis, whether we are going to put, and for my practice for stage two, I always put the arthroadesis because for a heel uh, to remain well girth after the medial translation osteotomy, and while waiting for the soft tissue to heal from the medial side, uh, this arthroadesis will be helpful. Just now there is a question whether we remove the arthroaresis screw or not. In the previous generation of arthroaresis screw, it's quite a big one. So usually I will remove in six months because the patient sometimes everything done, but he will come back with the sinus tarsi pain because of the screw. Hence we remove at six months, about 50% of them. But with the current uh, hypocure, which is uh, more well fixed, then uh, the removal rate for my cases is only about 2%, which we try to 
inject a steroid before uh, I remove the arthroidistic screw and followed by uh, FDL transfer. This is FDL, which I will take uh, from the uh, uh, hand, uh, not Henry, like Dr. Kong's uh, cases. Then I will look onto the uh, tendon, which I didn't use the screw to fix it. I just loop it and just suture around the posterior tibialis tendon. I don't remove the posterior tibial tendon, but some surgeons do remove the disease tendon. So this is a post-op with the uh, good uh, x-ray. A case two, about 56 years old uh, ladies again with the right media ankle and lateral foot pain with flexible joint. And this is the pre-op x-ray. And again, we do the media calcaneum uh, osteotomy. Of course, some people will do this with the MIS now to do the cut on the medial medial osteotomy. During the surgery, you need to check the in, in, image intensifier because sometimes we are very sure that uh, the screw is inside the calcaneum. However, occasionally we may miss the calcaneum and go to the medial border of the calcaneum, which after the uh, 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 post-op x-ray, you may get a surprise. Hence, you need to check the axial view during the surgery. And again, the FDL transfer for this patient and arthroarisis screw. So this is the common procedure, combination procedure that I do for my stage two patient. This is the before surgery and this is the after surgery. I think with the Dr. Chong line, uh, post-op x-ray is uh, quite well, although this is not a true uh, a mortis view. So uh, case three is a 68 years old with the bilateral mid-foot pain. Uh, you can see the obesity of the foot and very severe valgus of the foot and also the heart valgus. So in this disease, the subsequent stage of the disease, they will get osteoarthritis of the subtalar and transverse uh, tarsal joint. If we don't intervene at stage two and the patient was not given the mediac support, and this is the common stage that patient presented to us with generalized pain, more stiffness and soft tissue swelling in the high foot. So in this case, it's a more fixed on the x-ray and the clinically. So I classify this as a stage three with a fixed collapse arch. So the option, again, let them fed up with the modified through or the medial arch, but the medial arch may cause more painful because of the fixed collapse arch. So whether are we still doing the combination of the salvage surgery or we straight go for the triple fusion or any other surgery. For this case, I use the uh, triple fusion and this is one of the instruments that you can help to prepare the subterior joint uh, uh, to clear the uh, uh, cartilage. So this is a post-op x-ray. It looks quite good. I use a plate instead of screw uh, because I feel that it's easier and more uh, fixed than using just a purely screw. Another patient, same 66 years old with a left midfoot pain. And also I use a triple fusion. And now again, they I use a sinus star side approach to do the subtalar fusion rather than a big extensa uh, lateral approach to do this surgery. So this is a post-op and pre-op x-ray. And one more patient, about 70 years old ladies, also uh, obese, with uh, stage three of the disease. And I was quite happy immediate post-op for this patient. However, during the, the follow-up, you can see that the foot actually, the foot art is actually corrected and on standing view on the AP, is quite good as well. However, after about six months, seven months, nine months, he come back because the screw have protruded into the ankle joint. So in this type of patient with a bit of osteomyelitis and elderly, I, next time if I able to do this case again, I will not put too long the, uh, the fusion, subtalar fusion screw because sometimes after the weight marrying, it may 
get uh, protruded into the ankle joint. Hand, I will put a slightly shorter, uh, shorter uh, screw compared to this current screw. So this is my last case, which developed some problem because of the osteoporosis and long screw protruded into the ankle, causing the ankle pain, which I need to remove the screw to revise her. So with this, I thank you for attention. Thank you, Dr. Chua. Uh, triple arthrodesis is a traditional way to treat a uh, fixed uh, flat foot deformity. But recent literature showed good results from double uh, arthrodesis. How do you think about that? Will you change your way of practice? For the stage three, you mean using the arthrodesis? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean uh, arthrodesis. Oh, arthrodesis. Uh, double, double versus triple arthrodesis. Yeah. In some cases, I also do a double uh, arthrodesis depending whether the CC joint, the calcaneal cuboid joint is arthritis or not. If it's arthritic, then no, you are no, and if the patient is elderly, then you have no, I mean, you just go in and just fix the CC joint rather than leave it alone. Yes, Lo Chong. Some, sometimes, to in, in, in response to that question, sometimes, I just do a single arthro arthrodesis, a tailor navicular fusion, but I at the same time, I will do a medializing calcaneal osteotomy. Then I get more of the hind foot valgus corrected. And then the, the tailor navicular fusion, you can control the forefoot supination and, and, and pronation uh, very well. And, and of course, restore the middle column arch. Uh, hardly do triple arthrodesis nowadays. Is age uh, 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 related factors to for you to decide? Uh, then not the really, not really, not really. I try to keep all as as many joints as I can. Well, Doctor Wang, as you can see, this is still a non uh, single path for uh, for treating this. Uh, everybody's got their own algorithms, and and you guys have shed light on that. But um, I, I think as we continue to learn more about flat feet, we do the weight bearing CTs. We get um, artificial intelligence involved, AI. Maybe we'll have a single uniform way to treat this in years to come. But thanks, guys, for this uh, session. We are going to take a break. We'll be back in a few moments. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Farrakh.